Okay. So good evening, everyone. Um, I am Wesley Lin, Professor of Transcultural Arts and Design and Director of Creature. Um, today, we're really delighted to have um, two speakers talking about material engagement towards an experience of thinking with material. Um, let me first introduce you to them. Juliet Bailey is a sculptor working in metal who exhibits nationally and internationally and has worked in public and private collections, a member of the Royal Society of Sculptors and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. She produced her first publication, Material Perspectives, in 2018, and she's represented by Cavaliero Finn. And our colleague uh, Simone de Hompo is a reader in metal at School of Art, Architecture and Design at the London Metropolitan University. She's a silversmith of international repute and has been working with metal for over 40 years. Based in the UK, she is known for her metal work, being regarded as one of the most inventive, silver, silver, uh, inventive silversmiths of her generation. Her work is presented in museums and galleries in the UK and abroad. Her most recent project is the Glamourgerie Com Commissioned at the National Museums of Scotland. Um, before I hand the mic to both of our speakers, I wanted to remind the audience that this is the session uh, that we will be recorded and uh, you will be able to find the uh, recording um, probably um, in 2023 when we have the chance to archive them back in on our website. So we will um, you should send an email to let all the audience know about it when it's up on live. Um, and also just one housekeeping is that I already said it before that I hope all of you will keep your uh, mic and camera uh, off and we will have uh, the um, Q&A at the end of the session and we will invite you to switch on your camera and mic again during that time. And one last thing is that um, even though the seminar has been advertised as one and a half hour, it's likely to be an hour presentation for today's session. So just bear in mind that if you need to uh, reschedule your uh, uh, your events later on, then um, we're aiming to finish around like um, half six today. All right, so that's all for me, and I'll hang the mic to Simone and Juliet. Thank you very much, Bessie, for this introduction. So my partner, Juliet, and myself, um, we have a presentation together for you that reports back about our um, interest of thinking and thinking through making, and um, of course, it in involves materials. The presentation is roughly 40 minutes. And yes, at the end, there'll be questions. And you're welcome to ask us anything. And if we run out of time, you also know we are an, um, we set up mixed metal. And you will find out um, find us on Instagram. So if you want to get in touch with us later on, that's of course possible. Okay, so the presentation, um, the project and the questions we have. Um, we started off with um, wanting to do a fair. And um, when we find out, is it possible to have a thinking through making that involves a wider audience and how can we elicit some information from the viewers that they have an experience like this and that starts pretty much our research question no? um so just to introduce ourselves a little bit um a little bit more background, a bit more colour on who we are. I'm a sculptor, as Wessie said, working in sheet metal. Uh, I make abstract sculptures based on geometric forms. And I'm interested in exploring how we negotiate our emotional and physical place in the world. But more specifically, how what I'm interested in is how the in our internal experiences, things like thoughts, memories, emotions, interact with the physical world around us. That is the stuff of our lives. It's what characterizes our lives. But it doesn't matter whether we draw on philosophy or science or um, even theology. We don't really have a compelling explanation for how this kind of inside and outside combine. 
I find this fascinating and I think that making has something to um, contribute to the discussion because making is a microcosm of that human experience. When you make, you take an intangible idea, you take material and you put them together to form a new piece. Simone and I came into um, making from very different backgrounds, so I'm just going to say a little bit about mine, because what we found in working together is that our um, different backgrounds really shape our responses to, and it's, it's one of the things that, that makes for us the collaboration a really interesting one. And um, so I didn't begin life as a maker, I began life as a musician. Um, I spent, I was born into a family of musicians and spent all of my kind of younger life performing as a musician. Um, I then worked in healthcare before coming to making, before coming to making in my 30s. Um, and so really compared, compared to Simone, I came to making really quite late with sort of a whole set of skills developed from different areas behind me. So Simone, over to you. Yep. Um, so I possibly started my life as a maker as a dyslexic, not knowing it, of course, at the beginning. But I always worked with my hands and materials always matters. And I seem to have a really good um, natural understanding how to work with them. Uh, for me, the narrative of how you, I can use materials that they tell a story, that is really still interesting me and the juxtaposition of different materials, different forms, and what kind of construct they can build. That is an ongoing fascination for me. I work between objects that have an absolute function. So a spoon really needs to feel fa fantastic in the mouth and a cup needs to drink and be able to drink out without spilling everything and a pot needs to pour. But then there are also objects that are about a function, but the function is absent. And so it creates pictures, but they are pictures in 3D and they can be handled. They can be useful or they are contemplative. Yeah. So this is about us and now about mixed metal where we collaborate on a lot of things. And we had some sort of questions, maybe a little bit more about mixed metals. So what we have done with mixed metal, because we know each other as maker, but we know each other also that we ask questions to each other, which we always think, oh, what about this or what if? And that came to the fore with some of the fairs we have done beforehand with other people. And we really thought we should do something with this. So we'd done a fair a year ago and really started to talk during the fair because he had also the time to do this. Sit down, think about what if and our observations and what does material do to people? So we came to this question that we wanted to ask, um, how can people who don't make get an understanding about um, thinking through making? What are the possibilities of this, um, this eliciting information, gaining an understanding and using that in a different way? There's something happening on the screen. Okay, bear with us for a second. Very technical um... glitch. Mm, helpful. Sorry, just bear with us a second. Yeah. Um... Is that one of these up there? Sorry, let's just try. Okay, back in there. And so we were thinking about um, how we can give people a feeling about this. Uh, the, the question is, how can we give people an understanding of thinking through making? And 
what kind of project can we do? The background to the project is that we had these questions and I just, there's a, sorry, one second. Um, so in terms of the background of the project. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the background of the project and then Simone will go on to talk yeah. about the project in detail and what we did. Um, so looking at the kind of theoretical background of the project, there are two different types of making, uh, making as construction and making as thinking. There are lots of different commonalities uh, between these, including making skills, hand skills, but there are a lot of important differences. So making as construction is a little bit like making to a recipe. An example might be a simple and intentionally functional piece where I'm overtly in charge of what's going on and I'm directing the idea and the material to a preconceived end. So in making this construction, I come up with an idea, I design that idea, I problem solve it and then I make it. It's a linear process from start to finish. The skills that I perform and the ways of organising those skills are very organised and very predictable. And the aim of making is construction is to reduce difference and make the process as controlled as possible. One of the factors of um, making as construction, which is really important, is that it works within an existing knowledge set. In order to make this detailed plan, I have to work within what I already know. This is incredibly useful for some types of making, but not so good for knowledge generation. So there is another type of making. Uh, so this is a visual diagram of a type of making called thinking through making, which was a term coined by Tim Ingold. Um, in thinking through making, making isn't planned. Um, Instead, it functions around action and the communication between the maker and the material. It's a process that seeks to involve the characteristics and the responses of the material into the creative process as a co-creative force. So what you have is you have thoughts and ideas and instincts and emotions on one side and the maker weaving in with material body form and action on the other to create new conjunctions. It produces a web of interactions through which new ideas and new syntheses arise. What's important about this is that the maker isn't necessarily working within their own existing knowledge set, but they're acting uh, and um, uh, kind of improvising with the material in order to generate new ideas. So, I'm going to use a quick case study of this because I think it's a useful way to illustrate it. Some of you might be familiar with um, the film uh, starring Matt Damon, the Mark, which is called The Martian. For those that you, of you that are not, it is the story of Mark Watney, pictured here, um, who goes with an expedition to Mars. Their plan is to do 30 days of very planned, very detailed experiments before coming home. Needless to say, it all goes wrong. Uh, Mark gets abandoned on Mars and is left to improvise. What's particularly illustrative about this case study is that he has the same skills and the same materials both before and after he's abandoned, but works with them in completely different ways. And this is kind of analogous with the idea of making of construction, very planned and considered making, and thinking through making, which is improvising, working with the reactions that you have. So some of the features of thinking through making. Uh, as I said, it seeks to expand the current knowledge set. It's based on a loose goal rather than a very specific outcome. It's focused, it, focused on process and incorporating difference as opposed to controlling everything and pinning it down. And it's physically based using the body as the thing that kind of drives, the, drives that link between idea and material. It's fundamentally cooperative and fundamentally empathetic, which is a word that we'll be coming back to later in the presentation. Um, and it focuses, the, the reflection on it focuses on what's new and what's different. Because thinking through making also encompasses a process of reflection, which is separate to the processes of action. And again, this is something that we'll be picking up later in the presentation. 
broadly, the reflection and action combined together completes a cycle where there's an observation of what happened, that observation is contextualized and then transferred into further action. So why is this important? Why should we care? Um, we think that making is important not just because it produces objects of that we think are of note or of worth, um, and not just because of how it makes people feel, but because it models a different way of thinking. It models a way of thinking that's empathetic, one that's based on communication, response and partnership, one that's fundamentally cooperative and involves negotiation and the production of a shared outcome, and also one that's integrated with the physical world. All of these are desirable in terms of how we think, in terms of having flexible um, ways of thinking, but there's a problem with this. And that's that thinking through making requires a profound relationship with material, one that rests on hours of practice, years of experience and a very, very high level of hand skills. If we look at the skill levels that are involved, if you look at the base level, level what we've called the kind of toddler level, um, it's the toddler level is using hand skills through play as a way of finding their place in the world, both in terms of orientation and their own physical hand movements. On the next level up, what we call the student level, you've got uh, the use of hand skills where you're learning new skills, but attention is likely to be fragmented. It jumps between mind and action. Um, practice is important and there is a gradual improvement of hand skills and the problem solving that goes alongside with that. At the top level, at the professional level, is where those hand skills, where those advanced hand skills sit. And as you can see, it's very much not a general skill, but, but one, that's, um, one that's very specific. Uh, so this brings us on to our question, which Simone has discussed already. Is there a way in which we can give people who don't make an experience of this thinking through making? And Simone, I'll hand over to you to outline the project. Okay, and thank you for reminding me. I skipped ahead too fast. Okay, so what did we do? What kind of uh, things set, did we set out? We had uh, the opportunity to show at Material Matters. Material Matters is um, a show at Oxel Tower, Birkbeck, um, Bartschbeck House. It's on the back of it. It shows 40 different makers or organizations. It goes over four level. It's a building that has a character, to say the least. And um, the makers who had the smaller stands and were less likely um, be um, big corporate designers or so uh, on the fourth floor. That means everyone who wants to come and see the makers, and there were 15 in one room, um, they would need to climb up. So you needed to have a real desire to get there. And um, as the title says, it's all about materials and how they matter in our life. and. It's fair to say that the people who come there uh, also have an interest in that, wanting to find out. So what did we do? We had to stand. As I said, it's a characterful building. The floor, the fourth floor has only one window. It's a very long, elongated space. Uh, when we came in there, we thought, we would possibly show in the dark until the lights came on, which was a really good feeling. And then um, we were quite lucky to get this particular space for what we wanted to do. We showed our own work and sort of gave a flavor of what we can do with metal in our practice and in our selling pieces. But we also set out um, a playground for people to investigate and um, play literally with what we had. The kind of materials we brought along were really the materials we had um, from our workshop. So on one side you had an assortment of stuff, I talk about that a bit later, and on the other side the playground really was that felt. And 
Um, it's a sort of non-described field, but because it had the spotlight on there and the territory around it was a different material, it was described as such. And the kind of materials we brought along were quite often um, things we didn't make particularly for this event. We had um, things out of our scrapbooks. Most of you who are makers, you have an understanding that there are things you go halfway and then think, no, and I chop something off and I use it later. I can't chuck it away. It's just still too valuable. Um, things you start and you then lose interest because the shape doesn't look for what I had or we had at that time in mind. And so we went through both of our scrap boxes. We also taken a range of materials along and we spent one day in a workshop together and made really quick objects that had a relationship between both of our um, silent interactions through the making, which was quite a nice day to do that. And so the shapes, um, no, let's, Sorry. Yeah, no, no, the, let's talk about the people who came. And as I said, the fair was about materials. So they were during the week, um, Thursday, Friday, um, there were people who had a background in design or uh, in the wider field of that. And during the weekend, there were a different range of people, also parents with children and anyone who really had an interest in materials. And the kind of scenario what we set up was that we um, invited them to play with the materials we had, uh, that they go onto the table and um, we did in the beginning we did invite and because we weren't quite sure how it would work but very soon people came looked and then touched and we said of course yeah it's, it's okay to touch and they found out after a while maybe through observation or whatever they found out how how it works and so they were playing with it. We were at the end when they are finished asking them a couple of questions. We would take photographs, usually two, so we have two different views of it. And with some of them, we noted down their comments, not, not all of them, but the overriding feedback on, on their comments was that it was fun to do, that they liked to do this. The, the kind of visitors and their interests that they brought along were sometimes really sophisticated in that they came from other areas and they had an understanding of curating, um, whether that is through writing, through music, through setting up exhibitions, but not in the field of metal anywhere. And, and then there were other times where we had uh, towards the weekend more parents and kids and the kids really, um, had fun doing this and they played with these things and um, did really amazing arrangements. Um, kids more likely wanted to stuck, although we had also some grown-ups who wanted to pile things very high. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit more on um, what the material looked like. Uh, that the material was uh, not always shiny, it had different feel to the touch. It had um, it had geometric, round, square, all sorts of things. And the unspoken rule was here's a playground for you to play with it. Um, and we soon discovered that people then took some other things into the equation, which we didn't say or did not explain or so. It was just interesting for us to observe that other people were making their own rules, which we hadn't anticipated. Um, there were quite often makers, quite often they had the sort of tenacity to do this or confidence to do this. Um, some also went off 
the play field and some brought some really other things into the equation. So there was a range of people who done these things in a different scenario. All the objects um, were kind of innocent objects for us innocent. As I said, there were mainly sort of things we had done before. They came out of the scrap box and they had a simple coloring. It didn't matter so much, unlike silver, if a lot of people touched them. And um, most importantly, we didn't imply any intention to the pieces. So there were neither implements for eating or for other functions, nor were there particular container because most of them didn't even have a bottom. So they lend themselves very much to um, building it and lining it and starting to develop a kind of narrative in their own mind. Um, interesting it would be to observe that all these objects we made, um, the, the hand skill light with us. So they weren't given the opportunity we had over these years to become, um, to have hands that actually does a lot of things and, and think with materials, how to handle it and how to shift and maneuver material. And so the visitors didn't have that privilege of hands-on material of making and that sort of material understanding we had. Some knew the difference between copper and brass, others would not have uh, an interest in it. Um, so there were materials that were generally known because we all pass them, but there were innocent materials also because we had we have them around us. And um, and it leads to that sort of aspect of touch. And that was also something that we came on time and time again, that they would um, point a finger onto something, would report back that they felt a sense of achievements or a moment in the installation that was particularly interesting to them. And um, that was, of course, when we didn't have to ask any questions. Uh, they were happy to share that with us. And, and that sort of um, communication that happened between them showing what they had achieved and us um, sometimes asking the question. That were also interesting moments because some were really reluctant, not wanting to show and explain to us what, what they were thinking. They just did it and walked on. The, the background of the makers, as I said, were from a different kind of um, Field. And, and I think you can appreciate in these snapshots we are showing, and they are only a small selection of the photos we have taken. Um, there were different agenda for a lot of these people that they brought into the equation. Some came from an organized background and uh, were quite analytical, and others um, not necessarily. There was another scenario that was quite interesting to observe that in cases we had two people coming to the table. And it's not interesting whether they were a couple or not or friends or whatever. It was the interesting constellation, one person going to the table versus two people. And in most cases, there was a communication between these two people. And the kind of communication was also quite interesting. Now, sometimes you could see one quietly arranging something and then the other overriding it and, and rearranging it. Um, there were others who had the courtesy to negotiate. Um, and they started to talk what an end result would be appropriate for them or successful for them. And that was quite an interesting observation 
that the constellation, and we hadn't banked on that, that the constellation would change if people could communicate why they were doing something. So it's a, a sort of possibly uh, an active process of thinking and negotiating while doing something. Um, overall, a lot of people really said it was useful, which we thought was was quite a interesting word um, because as a maker, a useful thing is possibly when something works and we use a tool and that does the function and that is useful. But these people said time and time again, it was a useful thing, that they liked the uh, activity and that they found that, um, and this was from maybe a quarter, 25% of the people, that they said it was so uh, good to touch something which is possibly a scenario of our time that most of the time people swipe something but don't know uh, how a round piece versus to a flat piece, how an edge, how an edge on a rim feels, um, how these two, these different materials also can feel. You know, on the copper you have sometimes a residue from the soldering or the patination and others you didn't have that. So all of a sudden, they would go and, and recognize these sort of scenarios that happened for them. Some had, when they came to the table, a sense of fear of failure or so. Um, and that was also interesting that we never thought about that there needs to be a right or wrong or a successful or not successful outcome. We just thought the doing is it. And that is, um, that that's all there is to it. And um, a failure didn't come to mind for us. It's more this sort of hand and thinking and doing something with it. Again, maybe like swiping uh, a screen, this sort of fear of failure is more a contemporary phenomenon that people like to know beforehand what is the outcome, rather than emerge themselves into this activity of doing and seeing what's happening and having an ongoing negotiation in that process. So um, there are a number of aspects that we really enjoyed observing and maybe this, the, the, in summary to say what kind of objects people used, um, there were a number of them. Overall, we could say that people liked to um, use shiny things. Overall, they like to use or they use more often round things, colorful things. We had the scenarios that someone came, looked at the table, sort of asked through his eyes what to do with it. We explained his space to do what he wants, looked at us, walked away, came back after two steps, looked at it and picked one piece up and put that onto the table, onto the felt, into the spotlight. And didn't look at us and walked away. No comment, no nothing more. And it was actually a really good installation. We both liked that. When we liked also his awkwardness, what are you doing here? Walked away and then said, oh, maybe, maybe yes, and put one thing there. So that was quite interesting. Of course, we had all these people, and quite often they were involved with kids, but not exclusively, that they tried and used everything. So you couldn't see the tree in front of the forest, metaphorically speaking. And, and that was really the overarching um, experience that we had, that we needed to ask people, and that... Um, the experience of the objects was really what we tried to give them on hand. But this is possibly the moment where we talk about the reflection aspect. So 
what happened in terms of uh, the background of the project? How successful were we in prompting this experience of thinking through making by offering people these kind of half-formed objects to hand up? So looking at our criteria of thinking through making that we laid out uh, at the beginning, uh, people worked with a loose goal. We didn't see anybody come up with a plan. Uh, and in this sense, this was a success. People saw the objects, asked what to do, or were told what to do, and then just picked them up and started. Um, nobody thought, nobody planned in advance. So that loose goal was, was met. Um, people cooperated and responded because they were working with the ways in which the pieces fitted together, the way they balanced, the way they learned against each other. So they would act, the pieces would respond, and they would have that dance as the way of building up the arrangement. Um, they focused on incorporating difference because they had no choice, because they were working in this, the, they were working in this um, sort of iterative way. Um, this leaves reflection, uh, and um, for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about how successful that was. You'll remember that the sort of second half of thinking through making was this aspect of reflection. Um, the first half, uh, the action part, was successful. People didn't plan, they just did. They based their action on how the pieces behaved, how they balanced and how they felt. Um, and many of the participants, as Simone said, spoke about how much they enjoyed the active nature of that and all of the kind of sensory things that come along with that, with that active nature. However, without um, reflection, we don't really have thinking through making. What we have is a consumption of objects and materials, and we have an experience which appears as a good feeling. And we saw this in the vast, vast majority of people who really enjoyed what they did, but couldn't actually articulate what they'd just done. So what's going on with this reflection? Why is it so important? So the first aspect of reflection is to interrogate the experience of what happened. In our practices, that looks like working and reworking the things that we encounter in different forms. It's an iterative, it's an iterative process that might go on for weeks. This is just a kind of scrapbook example of one of those. And on, on here, you can see the subject of lines interrogated through model making, through making objects, quick sketch objects in metal, through photography, through drawing and through writing. What's important about this type of work is it's like a spiral and you're revisiting the same material again and again, but through different perspectives. The second aspect of reflection in the context of thinking through making is about taking this interrogated experience and contextualizing it, artic articulating it and reporting it. This could take the form of talks, of writing, of objects, of even film. But the important thing is that it gets beyond that personal experience and into a form that can be understood by other people. I want to use a metaphor here to, to kind of add colour to this, and that's the metaphor of dreams. If somebody wakes up in the morning and tells you about their dream, it's generally meaningless to you. It's just kind of chaotic and fragmented narrative that makes no sense and only has meaning for the individual concerned. But if that individual goes away, if they go away and they think about their dream and they reflect on it and they might write it down or they might maybe draw sketches of it and then they come back and tell you about it, there will be more meaning for you because there is more meaning for them. And that's what this process of contextualising, articulating and reporting is in the context of uh, reflection and thinking through making. So the purpose of reflection is to bridge. It bridges personal experience to personal understanding and then personal understanding into a more general understanding. And this allows for meaning for both self and for the others. It's a way of drawing conclusions. But what's really important about it and what makes thinking through making different from other types of thinking is that it's a way of, of drawing conclusions that incorporates embodied experience and tacit knowledge into those conclusions because they're right at the heart of this process to start off with. So it's a way of 
codifying, if you like, intuitive working into digested knowledge. So thinking through making is about this whole cycle, which goes from embodied action driven method right the way through to digested and articulated knowledge. And most of our participants only got half of that experience, with the exception of the couple of makers who were able to reflect on what they were doing. But that was because they have pre-existing skills. So what do we want to do about this? Uh, can we do anything about this? Ways in which we could adjust the experiment so that people perhaps might get this more fuller experience uh, is to give them more than one go. People who had more than one go were more able to comment on what they had done the second time round. We could phrase what we invite them to do differently, although there's a risk in that, that we kind of prefigure the answer and that we lose that instinctive intera interaction with the objects that's so important. Or thirdly, we could expand the experiment in a way that prompts more reflection and structure it differently. I think this leaves us with a problem and a question. Uh, the first problem is that like hand skills, reflection skills are a skill in themselves. We see it on the same three levels. At the toddler level, you're doing through experience. There's no reflection going on. There's kind of just trial and error. At the student uh, level, there's thinking and doing. They're two things that happen alongside each other, but aren't necessarily integrated. They're much more likely to be fragmented. So new knowledge might arrive, but it's going to be for the individual rather than for others. At the top, at the at the place where thinking through making comes and these reflection comes, it's really at the professional level, um, stroke kind of advanced postgrad level, um, because these skills are so advanced, but also in order to fully engage with the reflection, your hand skills need to be automatic because you need to not be thinking about what your hands are doing. And this is, again, an advanced level. So then what of the question? Is it desirable? Do we want people to have an experience of thinking through making who can't make? We think that empathetic and embodied thinking is desirable uh, because of this, because of this bodily based aspect that it brings to the way that we think about the world. But as an advanced technique, maybe it's just not viable for it to for, for us to help draw it out of, of, of the sort of general public audience. It does, however, leave us with a little bit of an itch to scratch. We, we think there's more to go on this. And um, so our future uh, projects will be looking at how we can take this further, how we can further prompt a curiosity about material uh, with a general public audience, a curiosity about embodied working that extends beyond the enjoyable, that extends beyond, oh, that was fun, that's the nicest thing I've done today. We want to find further ways in which we can get an empathetic experience of material and prompt a little bit of reflection so that people can think about this relationship to material, even if it's on a smaller level of thinking through making. So our conclusions. Uh, the experiment had value because people had a different experience. There are real barriers to taking making to a general public audience because of the barriers of hand skills and because of risk assessments and <laughs> the difficulty, particularly with metal, of taking fire into a building. Insurers tend not to like it. Um, and uh, so it had value because it gave people uh, experience with the material that they otherwise would not have got. I think what we've learned is that it's not possible to get this full experience of thinking through making and that there is a role for specialisation in this that we can't avoid. But we also think that there are further ways in which we can adapt the experiment to take it from that bottom level of the triangle to at least the middle level. Um, and I think that that brings us on to questions. Yeah. So I hope you've got them all stacked up. Yeah. And do remember to turn on your uh, cameras and uh, microphones, of course. And um, yes. Thank we welcome so any kind. Sorry, Wesley. Thank you, you so first. much, Simone and Juliet. That is absolutely wonderful. And um, there's a lot of thinking in the process, but also you're making the. Um, the audience thinking while doing at the same time so that's a wonderful exercise and i do have a few questions but actually um 
I also, uh, as a chair, I should um, be polite and offer anyone who has a burning question to ask on the floor. Is there anyone who would like to ask something? And you could switch on your camera and then um, tell us about your question. Well, why don't you start off? Uh, we have Sarah Roberts. OK. Hello, Sarah. Hi. Hi, both of you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And um, I was there at the at the event, so I had a little play. Um, I'm just I'd like to ask, are you taking this further kind of academically? Is this is this going to be kind of formal academic research that you're going to engage with? Um, in a way, it doesn't matter. In a way, you know, in a way, I don't care because it's really interesting what you're doing. But I also work for a university, University of Southampton, so I'm kind of um, engaged in, not personally, but I'm I'm sort of a subscriber in one way to that kind of research. So yeah, that's my question. Thank I you. I think we possibly have both two different insight into this. Um, one thing for me and Juliet will say her things is um this aspect of thinking through making um is really fundamentally of importance as most of you know i'm an excellent dyslexic that doesn't mm, mean that I, i'm not curious that i'm not curious on an academic level um and even if i don't read all the theory books i can still string up a construct of uh, aspects and in this case the thinking through making and therefore I think the the primary question is maybe after this exercise not so much about is it desirable for everyone to get an understanding of thinking through making we might even put ourselves out of a job <laughs> it is also it's more about this decolonization of um bringing things to the fore that come out of a different experience than reading books or making questionnaires or uh, gathering data so that data can also have this um, the sensitive aspect and that translates into verbal understanding and, and a theoretical understanding maybe but what do you think uh, so I think the short answer uh, on the one level is yes, I think we will be taking it further. But I think following on from what Simone was saying, um, I think we both have a flexibility around what the output of that might look like. Um, we're certainly not uh, averse to written papers, but we're also interested in kind of other modalities um, that might encourage people to engage with the material in different ways. Um, but certainly from the perspective of actually doing it, it was really fun. <laughs> yeah. It was really fun. And if we can get new knowledge and share new knowledge and share new information about that, I think that's that's something both of us would want. As someone who did the uh, did had a go at the material playground, Sarah, and I know we've someone else on here who had a go as well. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add about how it felt for you to actually kind of take part in the experiment. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was really liberating. It was really, I did feel observed. So if I'm honest, I felt really observed because you were both being very observant. Um, but it was, yeah, it was good. And it was really nice for me. You know, my my materials are really, you know, I I write. So I'm... I'm not even, you know, handling a pen anymore. I'm just kind of tapping a keyboard. It's quite, it's quite chilly. It's quite a chilly experience. So to actually handle um, metal, and obviously I'm very interested in metal. I've curate, just curated a show about metal, but metal on a felt surface, you know, there were different materials involved. And I, I, I do get it. I do absolutely get the whole business of, handling something in order to understand it um, and as a really lapsed printmaker um, I also get that kind of thirst for the handling of materials so yeah it was really interesting and I thought it was really good fun and I thought in that forum it was very interesting because you did have all kinds of people there 
you know, some of whom would be like me, you know, they wouldn't have handled that kind of material for a long time. Um, yeah, so it was fun, it was informative, and clearly informative for you. So it's so nice to hear, you know, your kind of overall impression of the, the kind of feedback from that kind of activity. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there any other question? If not, actually, I do have a question. I have, I actually have burning question. So um, I have two questions. Um, one, th one is that you were talking about objects. Um, the objects that you laid down are innocent, and I was very interested in these um, term of innocence uh, about um, uh, um, the extent to which materials can be innocent. Um, being a cultural studies scholar, then I kind of think about um, the the social aspects and cultural aspects of materials. So for me, materials is not is not neutral. So I wonder how you kind of um, go about to tackle these sort of um, affiliations of uh, um, connections, relationships, feelings, and prerequisite knowledge and uh, um, uh, background of materials and how that relates to the maker or whatever who is going to handle this material. So that's my first question. My second question is about... Let's do one hour, uh, okay, yeah, sure. Yes, okay, yeah, sure. Yes, okay, sure. think it's easier sure. than everyone holds that question. You sure. want to start? Um, so speaking of my own practice, um, as I said, I work in mixed metals and I work uh, in abstract forms. And one of the one of the reasons that I work with abstract forms is that when a piece is abstract but relatable, you're creating a void, you're creating a gap in which people can project their own stories. Um, metal is culturally, it's so part of our culture, it's culturally so central um, that people have their own associations with it as they have personal associations and cultural associations so copper for example is generally seen as warm and domestic because of copper saucepans and copper warming pans and that and that kind of thing steel is seen as hard and industrial precious is see sorry silver is seen as precious and so when you're putting these metals together you're creating a tension between these often unconscious associations and all of those feed in and kind of give um grit if you like into the way that people interpret a piece and create their own story of the piece because that for me is what working in abstract work is all about and also what the object playground is all about because the point of it the meaning comes through the story having resonance for the individual whatever whatever that individual might be uh, sorry whatever that whatever that story might be um and that was again one of the fascinating things that came out of it is that human nature to put a story on something and for some people that was um a very literal story around that looks like an elephant now that looks like a house or or something you know something representational for others it was much more metaphorical meaning around belonging or loneliness or conversation um and so i think the opportunity to get people to build stories that are meaningful for us for them rather through material is something that generally drives my work and a theme that came up through through the playground Simone. yeah i think the the definition about innocent um it's also to be taken from my point of view as a maker. Of course, I know that um, when metal comes out the ground, um, people have to work very hard on it and it's risky for them. It's all these aspects um, that also are affiliated with material which we didn't show there, silver, and um, that it came out of the colonization and all these things. So, um, yes, that is true that silver and a lot of metal are not innocent but at the stage of being where we were at that place um, I would like to, to take that word of innocence from the point of view for instance the metal itself if it had an ability to articulate itself 
it would say, I'm not harmful. I, I am not pretending to be this or that. I came together in a random form. And therefore, for me, the use of innocent comes in that moment of when we did the activity. Um, in a wider sense, of course, metal have have kind of uh, information and stories and they are harmful and, and, and powerful and all these other things. But at that moment, the metal also had the tolerance to accept anyone to touch it, which again, if we were there and everyone would touch us, uh, that would be a really weird thing. So these definitions have to be, and maybe we haven't made that absolutely clear. That when I say I, metal is my first language, it also implies for me naturally that I have a conversation with metal. And the metal is able to answer back when I do something to it. And and I can hear this. I can make sense out of this. So here we come again back to this um, that we are we have worked for so many years in this stuff, and we have built up a pattern. And these patterns are also to with understanding of certain terminologies. And that metal can have a voice, but it turned it tacit at that moment of this activity. It played with us and said, okay, you guys, you can do what you want with, um, with it for the time being. The, the, therefore, it allowed also the, the audience to be in active play. If they weren't innocent, if they had an opinion, that would be much more difficult. All right, thank you. That's a very full on answer. Thank you for that. And and um, I'm aware that um, uh, 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 Jay has also had a, a question, but I just want to give feedback on um, you both answer. Then I was just thinking about that sort of your response is actually a very good aspect for contextualization and articulation and reporting with these um, properties of metal in relation to the audience that you are uh, observing so that could be part of that process that comes okay. into play mm -hmm. so yeah yeah so i would well very quickly pass on to uh Gianna roberts hello both um Hi, Simone and juliet thank you very much for a, a really interesting uh, presentation it's it's rich with lots of um uh information and and questions um but i'd like to, to question you about something sort of very fundamental, which is um, what is the definition of making that you're that you're working with? I think you said, how can we allow non makers the experience of making through thinking through making? Yeah. So what what is making? Uh, good question. Um, I, uh, to borrow a phrase of Simone's, would have a very democratic definition of making, that it is taking something intangible, taking something physical and winding them together, weaving them together to create something new. Now, with that definition of making, um, everything is making. The way that we live everyday life is making. And I fundamentally believe that to be the yeah. case. And that's why I think understanding exactly what happens in the workshop has so much to contribute to how we understand uh, the human condition and the human experience and why I think making can stand up there with these other lofty subjects that uh, that, that investigate this. Um, but you're quite right, because when we were talking about non-makers, what we were talking about is people who do not have the hand skills associated with classical definitions of making. Now, the reason that we differ differentiate between these two is that what you get when you have those hand skills is some of the things that Simone's been talking about around an understanding of material, an ability to communicate with it, an ability to work with it implies that it's something one way and that's not really what we're talking about. It's a little bit like, yes, here's a, here's a, here's a good way of explaining it. We all speak language, we don't all speak German. 
So what I'm talking about, or French, or, or choose or choose your language. And so what I'm talking about is that in this very democratic definition of making, that's the equivalent to everybody speaks a language. When we're talking about non-makers, we're saying, in this case, we're speaking about German. Does that answer your question, Simone? I don't know if there's something you want to add. Yeah. Um, try, before you answer to Juliet, I would say that... Um, Making for me also has something to do with uh, an intention. And I don't mean um, that someone says, oh, comes to a class, comes to a workshop or whatever. I want to make this and has a conceived idea of what it is. Um, when I talk about intention, it's much more the starting points of following a thread, a path and deliberately um, following it, but also at a point saying, no, my intention or what I want to say or what I want to communicate through these constellations of material shaping it, um, the kind of tools which are always in the end product um, tacitly present. Um, these things are really important and that sort of intention is um, it's a little bit the difference between a project and research. A project has a beginning and it doesn't matter whether you have an idea that you want to make and you finish it and the project is finished when the thing is there. Whereby my understanding research is this, that you go onto a path and the path is really the road and the questions that come from right, left or from within or uh, out of the observation, they then feed themselves through this point of reflection into the next intention. And naturally, the intention can be overtaken and creates another intention. So in that respect, making is an ongoing process, um, maybe like lifelong learning or scenarios like that. Does this give you an answer, Joy? Well, well, yes. It 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 tells me where you're 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 coming from, and those are both very interesting perspectives. But but I might offer a, a, another perspective from my own experience of of making, uh, which is that that what people were doing in on the on the playground was was something that I'd call proto making, um, because um, there was no actual transformation of material by them uh, using tools, both um, words that you've, you've both uh, used. And, but but proto-making is a very um, important stage historically for human beings, but, but also for, for everybody that exists on the world at, at the moment, because it, it, it's a way of in, engaging. And, and the, the example I might use about this is that you pick up something that already exists, which is what your um, collaborators did and and you you use it for something so uh, a, a wine bottle already exists but but if you put a candle in it you, you you've made a, a candlestick um and historically my own interest has been a kind of anthropological um uh, perspective um in that when the first humans picked up a stone and threw it they made a, a, a missile but when they cleaved it in two in order to use it as a as a as a knife or shape an axe, that's making, um, and uh, they so they were proto making, picking up stones and using them as as something else, a shell as a bowl. Um, but they were that was part of the process um, to true making, which requires the transformation of of material. Um, so, yeah, I found it very interesting that you were. In encouraging these people to in engage with the very, very limited uh, skills that they had, but but effectively proto making or composing from already made things, which is something that you said you you were using things from your scrap box, which meant something to you, and you knew that they would mean something to other people who maybe fully didn't know what their meaning was in the way that you would. Yes, and that's I think. Yeah, I think there we can also bring a couple of other uh, um, 
definition to the word making that um, that sort of process of thinking to making sense out of these objects is a process of of making, I would say. But I, I certainly think it's um, it's an interesting point you bring to the debate. Um, I mean, in all fairness, we would possibly say our insurance wouldn't have covered <laughs> <laughs> proper sense of making. And and possibly we wouldn't get through as many people that we did in the end. But what do you think? Yes, I think I think that's a I really like that concept of proto making. So thank you. I'm sure you saw us both uh, grab yeah. our pencils and throw it down. Um, I think that I could show like, you a diagram as well at some other point, possibly <laughs> to be continued in college. <laughs> I think. Um, like a lot of they, these things, they exist on a continuum rather than being necessarily discrete, uh, you know, discrete um, uh, categories. Um, when we work with metal, we buy it in sheet form. Is that a pre-made form? Yes, absolutely. Does what we still do count as making? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I just went and lost all of my professional credibility. Um, so, you know, so yes, I think I think that's a really interesting distinction. Um, uh, yeah. And it's an interesting thing to feed back into future uh, future experiments. Yeah. Thank you very much. OK. Any other questions? I think Wesley had another one. Yes. Um, well, I think I'm looking at time because we say like we will time for an hour. So we're already um, over an hour. But certainly I would like to give this opportunity to uh, any audience who would like to ask questions, because just because I know that I can always grab a similar yes. sort of conversation. So I feel like I should be more generous to our audience. So um, it was a fascinating discussion. And I wonder whether we could have a last question on the floor before we close our session. Anyone? In any case, as I said beforehand, um, you can send us an email um, via Mixed Metal or on Instagram. We are there as well. Um, so don't hesitate to make contact with us somehow, somewhere. Sure. Uh, that's possible. And just for the audience information, will you be doing the same thing for next year in the design week? Not the same thing. Not the same thing, but you would still be in the design week. And yeah, you would do, still be do something. So obviously, yeah. which means that, well, watch this space. Definitely. For, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. Material Matters uh, next year is part of London Design Festival, and it's something around the 20th of September. Yeah. Uh, next next year, and it is in Barge House again. Yeah, and we will also show before that at um, Artifact at Chelsea Harbour, which won't be a hands-on uh, activity for the audience in the May. In the May, we might take the playground along and see uh, see how it works in a different <laughs> setting. Yeah. So watch both of these spaces, which we will show together under mixed metals. Perfect. That sounds very full on pro uh, project. So, well, obviously, I'm sure that audience will follow you uh, all the way and make sure that um, you tell us all these brilliant news. And um, and I would say, like for all for all the audience, do watch out our news item on our Creature website because we update it and also we we'll keep you informed of the latest development of all our uh, members' activities. So, um, uh, I will would... they be able to download um, or forward? the recording of this i certainly would want to do that yeah it should be but um i think that the the only thing is that we would take it would take us a little while to okay. uh, to generate okay. this just because um we are waiting for resources to update our website so the archiving um we may not be so uh, quickly generated but we shall be able to generate uh, at least through uh, YouTube. So uh, everybody should have a link, even though it might not necessarily be uh, archiving on our website right away. So I think that would be um, the way forward. Excellent. And last but not least, a wholehearted thank you from both of us, for all of you who turned up. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Wesley, for your introduction. But it's my job. I thank both of you for the participation and having this wonderful and absolutely fascinating talk uh, for the Creature Session. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'd also thank all the audience joining us today as well. Um, and uh, we will come back in January for the in the new year for another session uh, in, um, I think it's a 
25th of January on the Wednesday as well. Uh, we haven't yet put up the um, the 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 um, uh, the event, uh, but they would be soon appearing um, in the coming. I think it would be probably in the um, coming weeks before Christmas. So that is what we aim for it. So it is another uh, talk on uh, art practice um, in collaboration with um, uh, um, musicians and also looking at um, auto ethnography and um, also filmmaking. So well, watch this space and uh, watch out for our Creature News to get more of these details. So um, a big, big thanks to both of you. Great Thank session. You. Thank you. And I'll see you all next time. OK. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Team was never to be seen again.